All right, open your Bibles with me, please, to Luke chapter 12. We're going to begin with verse 49. Luke 12 and 49. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the rain and the cooler weather. You know what a long, hot, dry summer we had and how desperately Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, maybe others, need rain. And we thank you for rain and cool weather. We thank you for Sunday, special day for us, a day when we remember how you raised your Son, our Lord Jesus, from the dead. We're grateful for people like Luke, through whom you could work to speak a word that we need to hear, a word that we can apply to the living of our lives, both individually and collectively, as your church here at Boston Avenue. We ask your blessings upon us as we open your all-important book. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, when we read today this passage, you need to remember what Dr. Fred Craddock counsels. Dr. Craddock, you know, is one of those people I have admired, do admire very much. He's still living. Dr. Craddock grew up over in the southeastern part of the United States in a small little town, in a small little disciple of Christ Church, okay, the Christian church. He ended up finally in graduate school at Phillips Theological Seminary when it was still in Enid, Oklahoma, and was such an outstanding teacher that we Methodists heard about him and enticed him away to our Kenler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, um, bestowed upon him a distinguished chair there that he continued to fill wonderfully well until he had health problems about the time he was 65. Uh, he retired, but then his health improved, he and his wife moved to a small town, and he resolved that he was going to spend the rest of his life. Uh, we would all know him as distinguished professor and, and teacher, uh, pastoring a little tiny Christian church uh, in a very small little town. He continues to, to travel some and to speak. He's 80 years old now, but still really, really uh, capable. Dr. Craddock says to us who read the scriptures, you need to remember that it's not good to lift one little, what scholars call pericope, one little cut around out and make it absolute truth. You need to know that writers of the Bible are like a, a lumberjack, he used to say. They chop the tree from the right and then they chop the tree from the left. Chop from the right, chop from the left. And if you only take one swing of the axe, you don't get the whole story. And this next passage is one of those. It's one chop against the base of the tree. And if it's all you hear, and it is all that some people hear of the gospel, you've really missed so much more. Some scholars think these next few verses are written by Luke into his generation. The, the situation Luke is addressing 60 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus is a very different situation from that which Jesus lived in in his own time. That what Luke is addressing in these verses we're just about to read was a situation where most of the Jews have gone back to the synagogue. Two generations after Jesus, Jews have gone back to Judaism, believing that Jesus was not the long-awaited Messiah, that the long-awaited Messiah could not have met such a miserable death, could not have been crucified, a belief that Jews hold to this day, of course. They had gone back to the synagogue. Now the message is being carried to Gentiles. We're sure that Luke is writing to Gentiles. He's not writing to Jews, as was Matthew. He's writing to Gentiles. And in these Gentile communities, it really is difficult for a person to accept 
Jesus as Son of God, as long-awaited Messiah, when the whole culture is something completely foreign to that. The Greek culture now had become the Roman culture, this blending of, of the eras of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Alexander the Great, more than 400 years later, now the Romans rule the Mediterranean world. But much of the Greek thought and way of life is infused into the Romans. Historians say that the Greeks had the great ideas and the Romans took them and built an empire. So it was a fused uh, society a, 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 and a culture blending the some of the greatest ideas of the Greeks and now the amazing ability of the Romans to take those ideas and build an empire. But everybody, virtually, where this gospel was now being taken were polytheists, multiple gods. Uh, the Greeks had all of their mythology stories. The Romans had corresponding stories of mythology. They had, they had any number of gods. The god of this, the god of that, the god of this, the god of that. And to be a Christian, you're supposed to have just one god. It's Israel's god. Same one who was at the burning bush for Moses, whom now these Gentiles are being asked to believe, had come in flesh and blood to a young Jewish woman living in a nowhere place called Nazareth. So small and insignificant, it does not appear a single time in the 39 scrolls of the Hebrew Scriptures. Not a single time. A little nowhere place. 250, maybe 300 people. And that she birthed somebody who was God in flesh, incarnate. So you can see that if one person, male or female, embraces this message they're hearing, the strife it would cause in a family. you see that? To walk away from everything your parents and grandparents have believed. I mean, for Jews, it wasn't that big a step to become a Christian. We're still talking about the same God. Can you believe that God was present in flesh and blood in the way he never had been before? A step that many of them, now almost all of them by Luke's time, are not willing to take. But for Gentiles, it was a far bigger step to first believe there's only one God who created everything that is, and that one God chose to appear in a baby born to this young Jewish mother in nowhere Nazareth, you see? So you can see what would happen within families. I mean, even eating was a problem because virtually everything sold in the markets of these Greek Roman cities had been somehow offered up first to the gods. So is it okay to eat something that's been offered to the gods and now is being sold in the marketplace? I mean, it was brought in by the farmers, the first fruits of their crops. Now it's sold in the marketplace, once offered to gods, goddesses, in whom you can no longer believe. Can you now eat it? All kinds of things. So they believe Luke is addressing a situation that's far more prevalent in his time than was true in Jesus' time, where Jesus spent his entire lifetime really among Jews. He makes it very clear, I was sent to the people of Israel. There are a few times that he ventures out into Gentile territory, and we've been looking at some of those, but not many. So listen, listen carefully to what Luke writes. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. We know that he's been telling his followers in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, that, that God is going to send him to Jerusalem, and there he's going to meet death, that those who are violently opposed to the message he's delivering are going to kill him. And that had to have, I mean, if we really believe he was very man of very man, along with being very God of very God, as the Nicene Creed says, then... To have that hanging over you 
you're going to die when you get to Jerusalem. You don't know exactly how, exactly when, exactly what circumstances, but you're going to die. This is hanging over him. I wish we could get this over with, is pretty much what he's saying. But then these words. Do you think I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. When I was in Houston, right out of seminary, a long time ago, they started having break-ins into some of the wealthy homes out in the Memorial Drive section where I was associate minister at Memorial Drive Methodist Church. And then they discovered that these privileged kids, this was a privileged neighborhood, were stealing from their own parents. That there was a crazy uh, little group that had come into Houston and were convincing these young people that this passage right here, man, if you're going to follow Christ, you've got to be against your mother, against your father, against your mother-in-law, father-in-law, and so on. Steal from them and bring it to us. And they were stealing and bringing it to these perpetrators of this fraud. They had seen one swing of the axe and didn't really understand what it was trying to say to them. It was very difficult. You can imagine a little bit of that difficulty today if you experience what we clergy do when a Methodist who's grown up in a church like ours marries a Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Or what happens in some families when a Protestant marries a Roman Catholic? Even more dramatically, what happens when a Christian marries a Jew? Rabbi Sherman and Rabbi Fitzerman, dear friends of ours, still say they will not participate in a wedding of a Christian and a Jew because they say we always lose one more good Jew. Eventually, They may not go with the Christian partner, but they don't come to synagogue or temple either. We lose them. So we're not going to go through that charade, they say, that we're joining these people happily because we are a diminished people when our people intermarry. Last Sunday afternoon, I came out of the BOK arena at the end of the 9-11 service. I was about to walk to, to my car in the garage across the street there. And one of the Muslim women, uh, whom I've known several years now in our trial law groups, said, Dr. Biggs, I turned around. This is a very capable woman. She has a Ph.D. She is an educator. And she said, I want you to do a favor for me. I said, okay, I will be glad to if I can. And she said, you probably don't know. Now here she's got her head all wrapped up with a scarf and everything. There's no question about who she is and what she is. She said, I grew up a Methodist in upstate New York, in Binghamton, New York. I said, really? I've known her probably ten years at least. She had never said that to me before. I grew up a Methodist. And I said, oh, really? She said, yes. And now my father has died. And my mother needs to be closer to us. So she said, though I married a Muslim and became a Muslim, my mother has remained a Methodist all these years. And I've looked around the city to try to find a good place for my mother to live. And you know what I decided? The Zara campus. Now, is this mixed up or not? Her mother is a Methodist. The daughter is a Muslim. She's putting her mother in a Jewish home and wanted me to go visit her. I said, sure, we will do that, absolutely. And she said, I think she uh, may not be able ever to come to your church, physically able, but her mind works well, and she would love feeling like she's a part of that church on television. I said, okay. Can you imagine how difficult that must be if you really believe in the Methodist church And your daughter marries a Muslim and becomes a Muslim and she becomes very active with Jews and trial log and so on. That's how crazy mixed up our world is today. 
Sunday afternoon as I was uh, in the waiting room there before the service started. And uh, we had a Hindu and a Buddhist. They claim that in Tulsa, Oklahoma now, we have more than 5,000 Hindus. And the Buddhist says they have more than 5,000 Buddhists in Tulsa. Hmm. It's a very different world. It's not nearly so simple along religious lines as it was when I was growing up in Panola County, Texas. I remember my brother 20 years ago probably saying, you know, we email each other first thing in the morning, be sure everybody's all right. And he said, well, there's a new day in East Texas. A mosque has been opened in Tyler. And uh, for sure, it, it was a new day. A new day in rural East Texas that they had a mosque. Uh, when First Methodist Church in Richardson, Texas, a suburb of North Dallas, decided they needed to build a, a new and bigger place over on uh, LBJ, uh, freeway there, they tried and tried and tried to sell their church for almost a year, and nobody had offered anything like the value of their present church. And then they got a call one day, and the Buddhists wanted to buy it. And I asked the pastor, who is the son of a late bishop, Bishop Oliphant, I asked Clayton Oliphant, well, how did you handle that? He said, I really was frightened uh, almost to call the chair of my board and tell him that the Buddhists wanted to buy our place. And what did he think about it? And he said, be sure their check is good. That's all. <laughs> so what was First Methodist Church in Richardson, Texas, is now the Buddhist temple. <clears throat> And you heard Bob Long when he came to do our Barton Clinton Gordy series last winter. The church he founded in Houston, right out of seminary, Mission Bend United Methodist Church, was bought by the Buddhists. And the church Bob built there is now Buddhist Temple. So it's a, it's a different world, even in the United States of America, even in Tulsa, even in rural East Texas. It's a different world. And maybe we can understand a little bit of what Luke was trying to say, that it will be difficult when not all members of your family believe the same thing, worship in the same place, maybe even espouse the same set of beliefs or, or moral teachings. It will be difficult. It doesn't mean you're supposed to go steal your mother's jewelry and give them to some shyster. Verse 54. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west... Okay, where would west be for them? Mediterranean, yeah. A cloud from the west would mean coming off the Mediterranean. You say, it's going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, which would come from the desert, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. I mean, you and I can watch the weather, and when we see our weather people say, well, we have a front coming from... The north, a cold front, that means one thing. And when they says it's coming from the southwest, and you and I know we're getting wind right out of uh, Amarillo, Texas, we know it's going to be hot and dry, hot and dry. So Luke knew that. Jesus knew that too, of course. People talked about the weather even when Jesus lived. You say there will be scorching heat and it happens. You hypocrites, and remember hypocrites, that word means those who wear the masks in the Greek theater. That's what this word comes from in Greek. Uh, one person might play several roles and they would hold up little masks. You remember they had a little handle on the mask and so they could hold up the mask over their face and play one character and hold up another mask and play another character. Um, and those who did that were acting. They were acting. And so Jesus says, you're, you're acting here. You're not really who you are. You're playing a role of some sort. For you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Meaning there's so many who still weren't getting it. Weren't getting it. Weren't understanding. Let's skip to chapter 13. <clears throat> At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those eighteen who were killed when the tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Now, this is trying again to address the old question, when bad things happen to people, they must have done something bad. And when good things happen to people, that must be some indication they're really good people. And all through the years, people have dealt with that question, of course. Uh, in the sermon, if you haven't been to church yet, you'll discover that I'm going to mention uh, Thornton Wilder's novel, The Bridge of San Luis Rey. So long, long ago, of course, 1927, he wrote this book. What's interesting to me, maybe he had a speech writer, I don't know, but ten years ago when we had the horrible events of 9-11, the British had a number of their citizens who were working in the Twin Towers too. You know that there were people killed who came from more than 30 nations. It wasn't just Americans. It wasn't just one religion or any such thing. Well, the British were having a service. Uh, once they had names of their citizens who had perished in the Twin Towers. And Tony Blair was still Prime Minister, so he was asked to speak, of course, and his closing sentence was a quotation from Thornton Wilder's The Bridge of St. Louis Ray. I'll tell you more about that at church if you haven't been yet. But basically, Thornton Wilder is struggling with the same old question. When the Bridge of St. Louis Ray fell, why did the five people who were on it die instead of five other people? Why not the five who were crossing the bridge just before them, or the five who were just about to cross the bridge after them? Why those five? And he even has a Catholic priest character in the book who just keeps delving deeper and deeper into the lives of these five. What connection was there between the way they had lived and the way they died? You know what he found? No connection at all. No connection at all. Thornton Wilder was struggling with that. But in the sermon, there's a different point, and I'll tell you what that is if you haven't been to church yet. There's another point that Thornton Wilder makes. But the age-old question, you know, why do innocent people suffer and die? And again, the Salvation Army is still running this, uh, this wonderful ad. I think it's terrific. Uh, I've seen it several times. It uh, uh, looks like a young woman walking through uh, streets devastated by a tornado. It looks like Joplin, Missouri. I don't know if that's where the picture was taken because there were other horrible uh, tornadoes last spring, including Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and so on. But uh, it, it looks like some of the pictures I saw of Joplin. Anyway, she's walking and just devastation on both sides of her. And it says, when natural disasters occur. We do the acts of God. I love that. Because, you know, insurance companies, for lack of a better way, they've often called those kind of things acts of God, acts of God. Nobody's responsible. They're just acts of God. I like the Salvation Army's take on it. These are natural disasters, uh, and when they occur, then we and other good people do the acts of God following. Verse 6, he told this parable. So here again, uh, we're seeing how Luke and Matthew add teaching material. Uh, Mark's gospel first, much briefer. They follow his basic outline of what happened next, but they keep adding teaching material that they seem to have gleaned from a third source that we no longer have, which the German scholars called the quella, the source, or Q. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. If not, you can cut it down. End of the story. Dr. Brandon Scott said Jesus didn't explain them. He just told them, walked away. 
Brendan Scott writes probably 25 pages on that little parable in his latest book, and you know his conclusion? So what do we do? We just keep on manuring, he said. Just keep on manuring and hoping and praying. Just keep on manuring. Maybe that rascal will bear fruit one of these days. We who are in the church just keep on manuring and hoping. But Jeremiah, in the passage appropriate for today, again, if you haven't been to church, Jeremiah says God is grieving because he comes to the vineyard and finds no grapes, and he comes to the fig tree and finds no figs. I think the message is pretty clear there, of course. Uh, By their fruits you shall know them. You're supposed to be the people of God, Jeremiah was saying to Israel. And Jesus is saying to Israel, that's the ones to whom he was speaking. But Luke is now saying to all us Gentiles, you have to bear fruits worthy of repentance. Uh, That is, if you really have turned to God, then people should be able to tell because of the way you act. The way you act should tell them whether you have really made a significant turn or not. Verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Note here again, in Luke's Gospel, over and over he points out that Jesus was a part of an observant Jewish family. His mother and father were careful to have him circumcised on the eighth day. They were careful in Luke's Gospel to take him back to Jerusalem to be bar mitzvahed when he was twelve. And... Faithfully, regularly, he is in the synagogue. And he's not only in the synagogue, wherever he goes, he goes to the synagogue. But he's doing what he said he came to do, which was teach. I didn't come for the healings. He does heal. So that wasn't the primary reason God sent him. God sent him to teach. So that's what he's doing. As he's teaching on the Sabbath, so it's probably a Saturday, could have been Friday night, of course, more likely Saturday, just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. Now, this spirit is not defined in in Greek. It's the word pneuma. In Hebrew, you know, it's the word ruach. And both of these words in the two languages can mean wind, breath, or spirit, depending on context. So there's something in this woman's life that has made her crippled for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, but not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord, here again Luke is already letting these Gentiles know who Jesus is. He is identified in Luke's gospel right from the start as the one Uh, and that God is present in him, that same God who was at the burning bush. The Lord answered him and said, here again, this word, you hypocrites, wearing your masks, flipping the masks over your face, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger? Remember, a manger was simply a trough, a feeding trough. Jesus, when he was born, was placed into a feeding trough where there were animals. And so they might tie a little burro to the feeding trough so he will eat, eat, eat until it's time for him to move on. Uh, Do you not untie your ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water after each you need to drink? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom the liar has bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. One year at the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday celebration here in our church, 
one of the African American preachers preached on this text, this very one. And uh, he told it so dramatically, and finally he, he, you know, the point was he kept saying, so brother and sister, stand up straight. Stand up straight. You have been bent over all your life. It's time, by the grace of God, to stand up straight. Dr. King said, you can stand up straight. And every time he'd say it, he would sort of strut from one side of the pulpit to the other, and the crowd came alive. I loved it myself. I thought it was terrific. Uh, the one who can help you uh, stand up from whatever your burden is, whatever load you're carrying, whatever is keeping you from being something less than God created you to be, stand up straight and walk out of here. You know, I thought it was great. All right, let's skip to verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Go away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now notice here that in so many places the Pharisees are portrayed as enemies of Jesus, and here you have a chopping from the other side of the tree. Pharisees come and tell him, you're in danger. Why don't you move on? Uh, Herod wants to kill you. Now we know that Herod the Great, of course, has been dead for years, and his territory has been carved up by his three sons. And if he's moving toward Jerusalem now, if he's in the Jerusalem area, then he's dealing with the same one of these three Herods who imprisoned John at the fortress, we believe, down at Machaerus, which is near Jericho, and uh, that he might well do the same to Jesus and on a whim could cut his head off the way he did John. Uh, he, he is in danger, for sure. And it's the Pharisees who come and tell him, uh, you're in danger. So, you know, I had a professor many years ago that said, I frankly believe Jesus was a Pharisee himself. Uh, the Pharisees were the broader sort of middle class folk and lower. The rich folks were Sadducees who had everything going their way. They owned the land. They got along with the Romans. They had good paying jobs, often tax collectors and so on. And, uh, hey, eat, drink and be merry. Tomorrow you die. The Pharisees were sort of the unwashed masses who realized that not all in this life is fair and right, so there must be a time and place when God makes all things right. My professor felt Jesus was a Pharisee, and when they, you know, spar with each other, it's a lover's quarrel. These are his people, and he's trying to get them to look at things differently than they have before. Look at them differently from the way you have before. Come and warn him. Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way. It's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Uh, in other words, I, I know the enemy is there. But the enemy is not going to deal with me before I get there. So I've still got work to do. Even though he's told us in the last chapter, I really wish we could you know, get this behind me at this point. I know that something terrible is about to befall me, and I, I wish it were done. But it's not going to be done, not till I get to Jerusalem. And then he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And here, doctor, is... Uh, what you read or heard somebody say about Jesus might have thought he was going to be stoned. Listen to what he says. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See your house is left to you. I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And I had a professor too, uh, Dr. Webb Pomeroy, who was a native Louisianan, had uh, graduated Centenary College, uh, my alma mater, but had gone on to Union Theological Seminary in New York, where he had a very fine education in, in his master's program, and then on to Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, where he received his Ph.D., 
and then came back to his alma mater to teach. He was, he was wonderful, one of my favorites. And he believed that Jesus never really anticipated being crucified. Now, John would say, in his gospel, we'll see, John said Jesus knew everything. He knew everything that was going on. The synoptics seem to emphasize more. I mean, they certainly believe God was present in Jesus, but they also deal with the very man of very man more in the synoptics. If Jesus was really a, a very man of very man at this point, and he had some insight into what was going to happen, that bad things waited for him in Jerusalem, but he might not have imagined they would turn him over to the Romans. Just that the Jewish authorities would do him in themselves. And the way they did that was stoning. So that he might well have thought, they will stone me to death. And then, lo and behold, they hand him over to Pilate. Okay, chapter 14. Uh, on one occasion when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. They notice again, where is he going? He has been invited to have lunch on the Sabbath in the home of a Pharisee. You see? That's why some say he probably belonged to that party himself. I mean, it wasn't the kind of thing you signed up for, but that probably his sympathies were with the Pharisaic group, not with the Sadducees for sure, not with the Zealots who wanted to stick their little curved blades into any Roman they could. Now, that wasn't his group, but he probably identified more with the Pharisees than any other of the groups. Let's skip to verse 7. Uh, you just needed to know that he's, he's having a meal in the home of a Pharisee. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. All right, so here's more teaching material. More teaching material you have in Luke and Matthew. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited both of you may come and say, give this person your place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Philios, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or rich neighbors, in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, so what we have here is a parable that's about humility. And remember... Uh, I read this once, and I've always liked it very much, because I think it's right on. Uh, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Those are two very different things, of course. You don't have to beat up on yourself or put down yourself. You're a child of God as well, a daughter or son of the Almighty. You are a person of value and of worth. But thinking of yourself less means thinking of the other more. And if we just keep our society going with all of the, you know, rich marrying rich and rich entertaining rich and rich opening doors for rich, we get numbers like we did Friday, that we have more people living under the poverty line in the United States than ever before. Since colonial days, 16% one out of every six Americans is living under the poverty level. Do you hear Superintendent Ballard tell you 
that more than 65% of the students who go to Tulsa Public Schools today is on some kind of food program. That's how poor they are. Do you hear the numbers that if you live north of Admiral in Tulsa, you will live 14 years fewer than if you live south of Admiral? Average. Life expectancy south of Admiral is 14 years more than life expectancy north of Admiral. Okay. So, uh, who are the ones we're trying to help? Who are they? Um, our Downtown for Good is an effort to reach out to some of them. Our president of our Rotary Club this year is Phil Lakin. And this is not a speech for him to be a city councilor. You who are in his district decide that for yourselves. But he is the president of the Downtown Rotary Club. That year began July 1. Now, because Phil heads the Tulsa Endowment Fund, that's been primarily funded by Mr. George Kaiser, uh, it has moved Tulsa's Endowment Fund to the largest of any city in America with such a fund. More than a billion dollars in the fund. So he is very much in touch with all of the different groups in our community who are trying to do significant things for people who have less. And he's challenged our Rotary Club this year that 10 of our group, we have about 500 members. So in the, we don't meet uh, normally that Christmas, New Year week and so on. So we normally meet 50 times a year. So 50 weeks, will 10 Rotarians sign up each week that rather than come to Rotary that Wednesday, those 10 will go to a designated Agency. Did you know we have more than 50 agencies in Tulsa who are really trying to do something significant for people who have less? We do. And he has listed those 50 agencies and wants 10 Rotarians, 10 different ones, of course, to go each week and then come back and the next week, they will be given a Rotary attendance and, you know, make up for the day, come back the next week and they have three or four minutes to inform the club about what they saw and what they did the week before. And ten more out, you know, working with another group, and they'll come back and report, and ten more out going. And right. There are a lot of people in Tulsa who are trying to do the right thing. There are a lot of groups who are really trying to do the right thing. Uh, we're not always aware. We may be aware of one or two that we're a part of, but there are a lot, lot of groups really trying hard. And then there are a lot of, a lot of Tulsans who don't do doodly squat for anybody but themselves. So, uh, on which side do we line up? On which side do, do we participate? Uh, who, who are the ones with whom we're trying hard to work? Okay, let's go on. Um, verse uh, 25 of that same chapter. Luke chops this side of the tree again <clears throat> about uh, how difficult it's going to be for these Gentiles living in communities uh, where virtually everybody is a polytheist, has multiple gods, and the whole civic life is built around these temples, what goes on at the temples. Some of you can remember growing up in small towns or rural areas like I did, where the church was the focal point of, of life in the community. The churches were the focal point. That's, that's where people came together. I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, the women on, on Mondays and the men on Thursday mornings for breakfast or whatever. The church and what happened at the church was key to the whole life of the community. And when Bishop Williman gave our Barton Clinton Gordy series some years ago, he said, America changed. And he told what Sunday afternoon it was back in 1964. When the movie theater in Greenville, South Carolina, decided to open on Sunday afternoon, the world changed. Well, nobody's taking care of our Sabbath now. The church, the synagogue, the mosque are not the center of the universe for most of us. Most of our citizenry, we're peripheral now. We're fighting a tougher battle than we have in a long, long time in the United States. Uh, anybody and everybody. I mean, they schedule Little League baseball tournaments on Sunday morning now. They've been doing gymnastics and soccer for years. 
pick a pick an activity. The kids are being uh, led away to one thing or another, and Sunday morning is nothing different from Saturday or Friday or anything else. So we're experiencing a little bit more of that. Nobody's going to take care of our Sabbath anymore. And Luke knows that these converts to Christianity were having a tough time. Large crowds were traveling with him. He turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother. Now, your scholars who translated this are trying to be honest to the text. But scholars say that in Judaism, in Aramaic, you didn't have the same uh, ways of, of of comparing adjectives. Uh, that we do today. We have the comparative, we have superlative. You know, comparing two things or comparing more than two things to each other. Uh, better or best, you know, worse or even worse than that. You know, bad or worse, I meant to say. It was, uh, so this word about who, whoever comes to me and does not love father and mother less wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, less cannot be my disciple. Your focus needs to be the Lord, your God, who is one, and expects of you that you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then everything else will fall into place beside that. So whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Here again, he's chopping the tree from one side. And as we discovered with the rich young ruler, this is a very specific word to some or the other. And Jews and Christians have decided, well, that's not exactly what he meant. Because there are other passages that talk about how God wants to give good gifts to you. He wants to give good gifts to you. If you think you know how to love your children, Jesus said, being sinners that you are, your son asks for a piece of bread, you don't give him a stone. He asks for a fish, you don't give him a serpent. How much greater does your Father in heaven know how to give good gifts to you? So you see, it's one side of the tree. What do you love more? God, God's will, God's way, or something you have? Some possession. Something that's really more important to you than your relationship with God. And more important than your right relationship with others. When things get in the way. So first, it's got to be God. But second, I mean, Jesus said second is that you treat others the way you want to be treated. Chapter 15. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. Remember what Luke has said before? The common people heard him gladly. Common people. Now, look who he's attracting here. Gee, the worst. Tax collectors. Sinners were coming near to listen to him. So now the people who went to the synagogue every Sunday, the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners, <coughs> eats with them. See, this doesn't have the meaning it had. It doesn't have that for you and me. We eat with anybody. We eat with everybody. 
We have such public restaurants now. We have fast food. You rush in, you rush out, or even if you sit down, you're surrounded by all kinds of people. All kinds of people. Thursday night, Gail and I, uh, and Rabbi and Charles and Nancy Sherman, went to the Greek festival together. And it, it turned out that after we'd gone through the line and had our food, Gail and Nancy were facing the rabbi and me at our table, and he and I happened to be facing where the line was coming in to the food. And I said to him at one point, Rabbi, look at how diverse this group is. Which was good, of course. Very good. I mean, as we watched, there were African Americans. There were Caucasians. There were old couples. But there were little young families with little bitty ones in strollers, babies in arms. There were a few groups of just teenagers. Four, six teenagers together coming through the line to the Greek festival. That's what America is now. That's who we are. We with anybody. We with everybody. Not so in Jesus' time. Jews didn't eat with Samaritans. They didn't use the same utensils. They didn't drink from the same cup. For a Jew to go into a Gentile house could be considered ceremonially now unclean, impure. There was a great separation. And so they are accusing him. Look, he eats with them. One of my professors, who also came to do our Barton Clinton Gordy series many, many years ago, Dr. Bill Power, uh, he was a Canadian Anglican, if you remember, uh, an Anglican from, from Canada, who, uh, after getting his Ph.D. and everything, ended up in the United States, and we Methodists lured him down to Perkins School of Theology, and he taught there for nearly 30 years before he retired. I thought he was terrific. I thought he did a great job when he came here. He was my second or third invite uh, to the series. The committee didn't know him, but they went along with me, and, and I thought he was really, really terrific. He told a story about uh, having a sabbatical from the seminary. Professors get you know, every seventh year they get a break with pay. And so he was in Israel working on an archaeological dig. And one day he said it was so hot. And there was a kid, a teenage boy, a young teen, came up to him and asked if he'd like to have an orange. And he said, I would love to have an orange. And this kid gave him a big, beautiful orange. And he said, I peeled it and ate it, and it was wonderful. And the kid said, now you owe me. You have eaten with me. You have eaten my food. You owe me. Dr. Power said, what do you want? He said, I want to go to America. <laughs> so he said, I discovered you have to be careful with whom you eat and whose food you eat. It means if you eat with me, you owe me. If you eat with me, I can count on you. If you eat with a tax collector, you're telling him he can count on you to be a friend. He's befriending them. That's the problem. He's befriending tax collectors and other sinners. So what did Jesus do? He told them a parable. Matthew and Luke grabbed these stories which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Some say, well, not everybody would do that. You wouldn't leave ninety-nine to go find one. You could go into lots of detail there. When he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And you and I have all seen paintings of Jesus with a little sheep across his shoulders holding two legs with each hand around his neck. Yep. He lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, I've found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. I mean, remember, repent doesn't just mean being sorry. You have to turn. Turn, come back to the one who created you than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. 
And then he follows that up immediately with another story with the same point. What woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, I found the coin that I lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who turns who turns and comes back. And if that didn't get him, he tells him a story about a lost boy. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger one came to him and said, I know I get a third when you die. I want it now. And scholars say that in a shame-based society, that's the same thing as saying, I wish you would die so I could get what's coming to me now. You know that story. It's called the story of the prodigal son. A great German theologian, Dr. Thielicke, Dr. Thielicke said it never should have been called the prodigal son. It should have been called the parable of the waiting father. The parable of the waiting father. So, the point being, over whom does God rejoice more? One who's lost. Wouldn't it be wonderful? But see, Jesus is, he understands these Pharisees are basically good at heart. They're really trying hard to hold on to their faith and to observe it. These are basically really good people. But isn't there room in your heart for a tax collector? Maybe a prostitute who makes a turn and comes back to God? It'd be wonderful like finding a sheep you lost, like finding a coin you lost, like finding a son you lost. That's the way God feels, Jesus said. All right, if you haven't been to church, don't rush off. I'll be right back. I'll tell you about the bridge of San Louis Ray.